Okay, let's take your Bibles with me and turn. Let's turn to Philemon once again. The book of Philemon, if you would. First, Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. If you find Hebrews you've gone too far. If you're in Titus or Timothy, just flip over a few pages. Philemon chapter, oh, there's only one chapter. One of the smallest letters that Paul wrote. Uh, please read, uh, read along as I read. Philemon, beginning in verse 1 through the whole book. First, verse 25. Philemon, uh, verse 1. Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and faith towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Verse 8. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man, now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, Appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to me and to you. I am sending him back to you as part of myself. I wanted to keep him with me so that my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed may not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He's especially so to me, but even more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, accept him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self. Yes, brother. May I have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. So does Mark, Asarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The word of the Lord. Thought question as we look at this small letter of Paul. What is the power of Christian love? What is the power of Christian love? Where does the rubber meet the road in our relationships, what we believe. How is the church home, the body of Christ, how is it different from the workplace in our relationships? How is the church, the, the home, different than our school system? How is it different from the protest we see on TV, protest of love or unity? How... Or how can the church, the body of Christ, show God's powerful love? How do we do that? 
The answer is, or an answer, is in the deep and wide relationships that are grounded both in the grace and the love of God. Here's a statement I want you to hold on to. What if I told you that God's love in His house is blind? God's love in His house or by His people is blind. There are certain things that God's love at work in His people can't see. I'm going to finish this statement in a little bit. And it's almost as though these things aren't there to begin with. You know, perhaps you're a parent of young kids and you're trying to navigate through your house in the dark, through the hallway, only to find out that there's 2,000 Legos in the hallways and you're stepping on them with your bare feet. You didn't know they were even there. It's God's love like that. God's love in His people, is blind too. And I'll finish that statement a little bit. What would you say? Now, perhaps you've heard it said that love is blind. Perhaps you've asked a friend of yours early on in a dating relationship, you know, what does she see in him? Or what does he see in her? A couple of years into marriage, a young wife might ask the question, what did I see in my husband that I got married to? We say, love is blind. I might argue that God's love is blind when it comes to matters that are very close to us. God's love in his people is blind to, let me finish that, a work in progress. There might be more to the story, so to speak. You know, when somebody holds your hat when you walk in the door, you expect to get that hat back. And we'll come back to the statement about love being blind. That's God's love amongst his people, what it should look like. It should be blind too. We started the series in the book of Philemon last week where we find this is a very personal letter by the Apostle Paul to a Christian slave owner, a wealthy Christian slave owner named Philemon. And this book is about forgiveness and reconciliation of his slave named Onesimus. And this book has a very important backstory to it. Uh, talk to any fisherman or hunter in our mix, and you know exactly what a, a backstory is. They never, you know, come up to you and say, I, I caught a big fish, or I shot a 10 point buck. No, there's a backstory to that story. You know, the details, there's tension. There's things that are unexplainable at times. There's a backstory. Well, Philemon is similar in that there's an important backstory. There's details that we have to put together. There's also tension. And there's a few things that we can't explain with certainty. First, you'll remember from last week that Philemon, who is a dear brother in Christ, as Paul claims, is a wealthy slave owner. And Onesimus is perhaps, from what we know, a runaway slave. At the very least, he's done something very wrong to his master. And Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, his master, perhaps with this very letter of Philemon, a letter to uh, seek forgiveness, but also find reconciliation between them. And perhaps this is a newfound relationship uh, that Onesimus has actually found Paul in prison, who we believe is under house arrest in Rome at this point. So you say, why does that matter? Well, perhaps Onesimus somehow got to the Apostle Paul, who was under house arrest in Rome, a thousand miles away. And he got to the Apostle Paul, and he was changed. Now, side note, uh, if Onesimus was only seeking uh, emancipation or uh, manitouing him from Philemon, being freed from Philemon, he could have gone to the nearest town and found a brother and sister in Christ who could have made his case that he could be released. But instead, he traveled such a long way from Colossae to find the apostle Paul. There's also a chance that, again, he's a runaway slave. 
Or perhaps he stole money from his master. But at the very least, Onesimus left without his master's permission and orders. And he has gone to the Apostle Paul. And yet when he meets the Apostle Paul, his life will never be the same. It will be altered forever because of it. So the tension in this book is that Paul is writing this book of Philemon with the understanding that Onesimus has done something wrong, maybe terribly wrong, and he needs to go back and be forgiven by Philemon. But Paul is going to ask for a little bit more than just forgiveness in this letter. Now, second, we need to talk about slavery in the New Testament, or even specifically the time of Paul at least slavery in the book of Philemon. You'll note that Paul does not actually attack the issue of slavery head on. But instead, instead he's seeking to transform it through relationships in living out the gospel. What relationships need to change in light of the gospel? Now, we be, before we go further, remember that slavery in the New Testament is different than slavery in our own history in our country. Uh, at times, in a sense, uh, there were worse occupations than slavery in the New Testament. Uh, in some ways, slavery was better than we think. For instance, as mentioned last week, there are three different types of slaves in Paul's day. Some were domestic, to be working in the household. Others worked in agriculture, and some worked in the mines. And these domestic slaves were probably treated the best out of this group. They could work for their release. They could uh, buy uh, real estate. They had some rights. Certain ones had rights in society. Uh, if you had a good relationship with your master, or perhaps you are even related to him, if your master died, you could inherit his fortune, his estate in some circumstances. So in some regards, uh, some domestic slaves, the life, their lives were better, or servants, as sometimes it's translated, were better than we could expect. Onesimus is one of these servant slaves, uh, domestic slaves. But then on the other hand, slavery in Paul's day was also worse than we could imagine. And that way, slaves were a property with a soul, according to uh, Aristotle's time some years before uh, Christ. They could be treated ill. They could be killed and the law was on the, slave, on the side of the slave owner if the slave were to run away. They could be punished. One commentator says if a runaway slave was caught, he could be taken to an auction and sold at the highest bidder for his disobedience. So in summary, domestic slaves, like we see in Onesimus, had the best opportunities of these types of slaves. Uh, and there were other worse jobs in the economy. But much of it was dependent on their relationship with their master. Even their inheritance was dependent on the master and the treatment of their slaves. Conditions were very bad dependent on the master. And the slave, if the slave did something uncandid like run away, could face very harsh, even deadly consequences according to the law. Last week, we looked at the introduction of this book, verses 1 through 7, and some of the core themes that we pointed out in the first seven verses. You'll see the introduction greeting and Paul's great joy, and again, 1 through 7, which reads this. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, Grace you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and faith towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Now, in summary, Paul introduces himself as a prisoner of Christ. He's a prisoner of Christ, as we say. He's probably under, in this case, under house arrest uh, in Rome. Notice he doesn't say, though, that he starts off, which he often does, as saying he's an apostle 
of Jesus Christ. Instead, he says a prisoner. Again, if you've been with us in the Sunday evening uh, a series we're doing in the book of Galatians, you'll notice that they're uh, standing almost opposites here, uh, Philemon and Galatian. In Galatians, Paul boldly professes that he is an apostle, and he says, not by man, but by Jesus Christ, because he's seeking to reestablish his authority so that the church will listen to him. Not that he's lost any authority, but the church has taken a different stance towards the message that they have heard in Galatia. So Paul comes in with authority, he comes in swinging, so to speak. Book of Philemon, though, Paul takes a different approach. Instead, we see Paul is a prisoner, and yet he has a deep relationship with this slave owner, Philemon. And he's going to appeal to him in love. Now, even though there's some hints in this book that Paul could command Philemon to accept and forgive Onesimus, and that even Philemon perhaps owes Paul in the coming verses, Paul takes another route, and he goes the route of love over command and authority. Now, we also read this uh, Aphia and and Archippus. We're not exactly sure. uh, We don't have a clear explanation of who they are, but it could be Philemon's wife and son. Uh, One commentator said there's a tombstone in Colossae with the name Aphia on it, uh, but she's married to someone called Hermas. So take that for what it's worth and put it in your bag of useless facts for today. The last detail of the introduction, though, is that they're meeting in Philemon's home, a home church, which many churches and gatherings were at that time. We're not sure if Philemon's the pastor or the elder here, but at the very least, he's a wealthy slave owner who has opened, who has been converted by Paul and opened up his home for the advancement of the gospel and the use of the church to meet in his home. But what has Paul been hearing about this church? Verse 5 tells us, And then he's heard about their love for the saints and their faith in the Lord. Two pillars of this church stands out. The body of Christ here is their love and their faith in action. Now, this faith, this love will be tested in the next few verses, specifically in verse 6, which, again, is probably the hardest verse of this book to understand what Paul is actually saying. If you had the NIV, it reads like this, verse 6. It says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. That's a little wordy. Uh, The New Living Translation says the same verse, verse 6, And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. So according to this verse, it's as though Paul is saying, your faith is not quite complete. There's an aspect of this verse that Philemon has not fully experienced his faith in action, in good things. He's not realized or activated every good thing in Christ and it's going to be tested. You know, if you come to church regularly, and perhaps you, you, perhaps you feel like you're in a rut spiritually. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, you, kind of, you don't feel like you're, you're growing or learning. Have you stopped to ask God that he might let you know every good thing that we have in Christ? And the reality here, the possibilities are endless. Imagine if Paul... Imagine instead if he said, instead of saying every good thing we share in Christ, if he said, I pray that you can have some good things that we share in Christ. You know, as a believer, you and I know some good things we share in Christ. But I wouldn't say that we know most good things in Christ. Is there room in our hearts for more good things in Christ? something we can pray for. I hope so, that there's room for more good things to share in Christ. Paul is going to give Philemon one good thing, that Philemon's love is going to be tested. It's going to be tried. 
And only Philemon can determine how his faith and how his love is going to respond to Paul's request. So how is God's love in his people blind? Are you still holding the hat that I gave you? We're going to see four reasons why God's love is blind. Look with me at verses 8 through 16. This is Paul's appeal and the transformation he sees in Onesimus. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, and now he's useful to both you and to me. I'm sending him back to you as a part of myself. I wanted to keep him with me so that my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he separated you from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently. Notice verse 16. No longer as a slave but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He's especially so to me, but even more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So the first seven verses of this book was the introduction, or perhaps the the salad you might have before your meal. Then verses 8 through 16 is kind of the meat and potatoes. What is Paul trying to accomplish And verse 17, we'll kind of see a summary of his appeal. And we'll get to that in a moment. But realize, remember, I said that Paul addresses Philemon on the basis of love, that he wants him to respond. And there is a hint that he could, again, he could command Philemon to forgive Onesimus, to reconcile that relationship, but he's not going to. Instead, he's going to appeal out of love and his relationship for Philemon. So to appeal to somebody is to beseech them. Does that help? (laughs) It's to beseech them. It's actually, uh, the word has the idea of inviting someone over to your side in hopes that they can see things from your perspective. Kind of appeal to bring them over to your side. And we see this all the time. Politicians are always making their appeal. Come over to my side. Look at these grand promises I have made. Now, Paul's not a politician, but he's appealing to Philemon on the basis of love that he needs to forgive Onesimus, who Paul says he's fathered him while in chains in verse 10. That's a funny thing for Paul to say, but what he means is, It's more spiritual that Onesimus came to Christ after he came to Paul. Before that, Onesimus served Philemon, and Paul says that he was useless. In verse 11, he came all that way to Paul. He found Christ, was converted. Paul says he's now useful. He's useful to Paul and Philemon. You know, sadly, I think this is a sometimes a, in the church a necessary requirement to becoming Christians. That you become a Christian, you know, you're instantly changed, and now you are useful, where before you were just a useless individual. You know, those stubborn teenagers, those children who talk back, someday when they, they find Christ, everything will change. The sun will come out. They'll be polite. They'll clean their room. They won't talk back and they'll go to bed on time. Voila! (laughs) Useless to useful. No. Philemon might be surprised to hear about such a change in his slave Onesimus. But what is more shocking, countercultural, God centered is the change in their newfound relationship between a master and his slave. Verse 
Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon in verse 12. And even though he wants to keep him in verse 13, we're told that if Paul is found harboring a runaway slave, if in fact Onesimus is, then he could be in violation of the law. So he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon and hope that Philemon will, will uh, respond effectively in faith and love towards his slave but also embrace their newfound relationship in Christ. And Paul is very concerned, or very uh, uh, excited, uh, knowing of, of Philemon's response. But note that Paul is being very delicate in this section, knowing that Philemon doesn't have to listen to a word he says. He doesn't have to listen to Paul. He could reject Paul's appeal or request. He could discipline, even sell Onesimus for his wrongdoing. He doesn't have to accept his apology or extend forgiveness. But notice Paul hopes here is kind of like if you've ever thrown a boomerang and hoped that it would come back to you. He's hoping that Philemon will free Onesimus so that he can come back to Paul. Now, how do we know that Philemon did any of this? How do we know if Philemon listened to Paul, listened to the book of Philemon? How do we know that he obeyed Paul in love? Well, again, this is a personal letter that you and I are holding in our hands. Maybe similar to like a love letter that's passed down from parents to children and grandparents. You know, if you didn't want your children or grandchildren to have that letter, or if it was untrue, you'd probably just ball it up and bury it or you'd burn it. Instead, though, if the letter is true, and perhaps the events unfold like they were supposed to, you share that letter with your children, grandchildren. Perhaps it gets passed around the family. Philemon got passed around to other churches. It's not airing dirty laundry. Instead, perhaps Philemon allows it to be shared in obedience because he's helping the church by showing a path forward for other slave owners of what difference the gospel makes in the hardest relationships between believers. Verse 16 is essentially Paul's key verse or request. And that's a total change of status, is that Onesimus is no longer a slave, but more than a slave, because he's a dearly beloved brother in the flesh and in the Lord. Is Paul releasing him from bondage in relationship to Philemon? No. Onesimus is going back. He's still his slave. But the relationship in the body of Christ is changed. He is now a brother, a dearly loved brother. This is similar to the words that Paul describes Philemon in verse 1. Someone who is dearly loved. Onesimus is our dearly loved brother. You know, each morning Philemon waking up wanting to command Onesimus to, to make breakfast, set the table, go clean out the barn. Instead, they're brothers in Christ. There's a dramatic change in their relationship. And in doing so, will not allow slavery to stand or even exist. In describing the fact that Paul, again, says little about the institution of slavery in the book of Philemon, F.F. F. Bruce says this. He says, what the letter to Philemon does is bring the institution, talk about slavery, into an atmosphere where it could only wilt and die. Wilt and die. The church should be the place where social, racial, class, hierarchies come to wilt and die. When the church practices a type of love that Paul is suggesting, the norms of inequality in society, culture, class, and workplace will have no place or weight 
amongst practicing believers. Look at the weight or burden in 17 through 22. Paul says, so if you consider me a partner, accept me, accept him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self. Yes, brother, may I have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I hope that through your prayers, I will be restored to you. Notice Paul is very bold in saying, he says, if you consider me a partner, accept him as you would me. We talked about being refreshed last week when we come to church and that some people give love and other people's receive as though they are refreshed when they come to the body of Christ, when they interact with other brothers and sisters. I hope that we can be a church that practices this, either uh, to be refreshed or to be loving at the body of Christ. And But Paul asks in verse 20, notice the same language comes back in verse 20 where Paul asks Philemon to refresh his heart in Christ through love, through love, but also that Paul might have joy. He knows that Philemon will do even more than he says, hoping that Philemon will forgive, but also free his slave who has wronged him. And they now have a newfound relationship in Christ. Philemon, as a brother in Christ, can not only view Onesimus, not only as his slave, but now he's a brother. The relationship has changed forever, changed by God's love at work in his people. How is God's love at work in his people blind? A couple things, four things. First, verses 8 and 9. God's love at work in his people is blind because it's the basis for doing what is right. Basis for doing what is right. Paul doesn't command Philemon to forgive and accept Onesimus. He could. But what about the next time Onesimus does something wrong and Paul is nowhere to be found? You know, if I stand up here and command you to accept or forgive a brother or sister who has wronged you, uh, and you don't, and, and at some point I'm not around and something happens to me, you think, well, now, now he's gone. We don't have to listen to Zach, Pastor Zach. Well, what would you do then? But instead, Paul doesn't come from authority, he comes in love. But love, God's love will outlast your pastor. God's love will outlast the words of Paul, Paul's command. On the basis of love, second, God's love in the life of his people is blind because the gospel transforms us from useless to useful. Again, before Onesimus met Paul, their relationship was work-oriented, master-slave. But now their relationship is gospel-orientated. Before it was master-slave, you know, yes, sir, no, sir. Now it's Christ-centered, brother to brother, dearly loved and cherished by God in the body of Christ. You know, years ago, at some point along the line, uh, we were told in our Sunday school classes as kids that the human body is composed of mostly of water. And the sad truth that the human body was worth about $14. Now, that was years ago. With inflation, it's probably up to about $16 now, I would think. Priceless, right? The larger narrative of the gospel is that you are worth something to God. So much that he sent his son to die for you so that you can have eternal life with him when you put your faith in him. You know, the world has demised a life without God. But unknowingly, they've also taken away worth. They've taken away hope. 
like a vacuum that pulls dirt right out of the carpet. The gospel reinserts hope and worth back into our lives that the world has taken away. Third, God's love is blind in the work of His people because it breaks down social inequality in exchange for gospel equality. Verse 16 demonstrates, again, the relationship of Philemon to Onesimus in love and grace, forgiveness, newfound relationship. Onesimus will no longer remain as Philemon's slave, but his equal, not only in church and the body in Christ, but in life. There's a letter from Ignatius of Antioch in the second century that mentions this bishop of Ephesus. Well, ironically, his name is Onesimus. And the language of Ignatius' letter mirrors that of Philemon, which leads some scholars to believe that he's mentioning the same Onesimus in the second century as we see here, perhaps a very young Onesimus in this book of Philemon. The once a slave, then becoming the very bishop of Ephesus. It's not pro improbable to believe this, but if that were the case, one could be very influential, this bishop of Ephesus, in collecting Paul's writings so they would be used in the canon of the New Testament. This letter in our hands here might not be here if it wasn't for someone acting upon it, practicing sharing it, and perhaps changing the life of a slave, otherwise known as Onesimus, who could have helped compile the very books of Paul in the New Testament as we have it. Because the gospel transforms our relationships. When the world highlights words like class, race, title, rank, and power over others, the church has only one word that replaces all of those. And that's the word love. For the brothers and sisters in Christ. The final point is that God's love at work in His people is blind because it accepts and forgives for the sake of relationship, not because of similarities or preferences. So where does the rubber meet the road? I just mentioned the word rank. It's not a word that we use very often, but if we went around the room and asked those who served in the military, we might have them describe different ranks that they achieved in their certain, the time they served. I remember a housemate of mine who served in the armed forces 26 years, achieved E7 rank in the military. According to him, after serving you know, 10 years in the military, it gets significantly easier. The higher the rank you are, the more power you have, and the easier it is to delegate orders to others. Thinking along these lines, again, this is my, not my expertise, but rank is essential to our armed forces. Ask someone who served what the consequences would be if you disobeyed a direct order from a superior officer and you would probably receive a very clear understanding for disobeying a superior and what the consequences were. Rank is mandatory for order, discipline, instruction, and even in the midst of the battlefield. Again, I'm speaking beyond my expertise, so correct me if I'm wrong. But look around this room. If each of us were to give a rank to everyone here in areas of their title, race, class, power, and position over others, how would each of us rank? How would each of us rank? In the work we have imposed or stated these positions and titles, we would invite each other to give us our own worth. But when you step into these doors, your rank amongst Christians is zero. Your rank is zero. Why? Because Christ is everything. What do we mean everything? 
Someone of a different race enters our worship. No, no, you sit over there, out of the way. Someone of a higher class comes in. Oh, ho, ho, ho. take the best seat in the house. Someone who's low class. That's why they smell like they haven't showered in days. Here, stand over there, away from everyone. Someone with a high title, please come, center stage. Tell us your worth. Someone with no title. Why are you here again? Imagine if an illegal immigrant came to us, to Roaring Brook Baptist Church, and said, I am a brother or sister in Christ. I have nothing but the clothes on my back. But I heard of your love and your faith. We say a lot of words on Sunday. What happens when Monday comes around? If God's love is at work and his people is blind to titles, race, class, people of power and position, then why do we rank people or relationships when God destroys rank and position amongst believers? What withholds us from showing love to the brothers and sisters in Christ? Let's pray. Mr. Lord, as much as we feel like the words inequality and equality are such abused in our society, in our culture, Lord, there's something about your love, your grace amongst the body of Christ that transcends our feelings that transcends positions, titles, race, class, hierarchies. Instead, everyone who comes into the body of Christ is equal, equal before God and in our relationships. How Philemon must have felt the weight, the tension, of what Paul is calling him to do. But in doing so, is changing the course of the church and how we respond to the toughest relationships in life, particularly in the body of Christ. Gracious Lord, when we stand at the door and dictate Who can come in and who cannot? Perhaps we're playing in the role of God's love for others. Lord, help us to love. Perhaps like we see in Philemon. Perhaps like this love that Paul is calling us to. Perhaps it is a love that is blind to some of the things that people get hung up on. Lord, help us to love like your people should. It's your name that I pray. Amen.